Welcome to part one of Standards of Care for Diabetes. In this lecture, we're going to cover all the pertinent areas that are related to medical nutrition therapy and diabetic care. However, it will still be a very brief overview. As a review, you know that the classification of diabetes includes four clinical scenarios. In type 1, we have total beta cell destruction. This usually leads to absolute insulin deficiency. Type 2 diabetes results from progressive insulin secretory defect on the background of insulin resistance. It can progress until basal insulin therapy is needed. Other types of diabetes due to other causes such as genetic defects in beta cell function, genetic defects in insulin action, diseases of the exocrine pancreas such as cystic fibrosis, and drug or chemical induced such as in the treatment of HIV or after organ transplant may also be uh, problems that you would encounter in your clinical practice. Gestational diabetes or GDM is diabetes that's diagnosed during pregnancy that is not clearly overt. All mothers with diabetes will need preconception counseling because diabetic comorbid conditions are exacerbated during pregnancy. Glucose must be well controlled prior to pregnancy because there are serious first trimester side effects including heart and kidney defects and organs malpositioned in the developing infant. At birth, there are problems with poorly controlled blood glucose in the mothers and um, over the course of the pregnancy can cause macrosomic babies which is defined as a, bi a baby weighing more than nine pounds, shoulder dystocia and stillbirth. 50% of mothers with diabetes will require insulin. Oral agents are contraindicated in gestational diabetes. There's also an emerging type 3 diabetes that's been suggested at least at this point in children. It's a combination of insulin deficiency and beta cell resistance. The pathophysiology of diabetes results in changes to the intra and extracellular uh, conditions. People may arrive at a diagnosis of diabetes through any number of scenarios. For example, the fluid volume in the eye changes with uncontrolled blood sugar. An infected individual goes for an eye exam and finds out they have diabetes. Then, of course, they get their glucose under control and they have to change their glasses because the first pair doesn't work. Decreased saliva is accompanied by an increased plaque buildup in subsequent cavities. During a routine dental visit, a patient with increased cavities is questioned by the dentist about signs and symptoms of diabetes, including weight loss, fatigue, bad breath, and mouth pain. The patient is referred to the doctor for diabetic screening. Perhaps a patient is going to their podiatrist with an uh, ingrown toenail that won't heal. Hyperglycemia increases fungal and bacterial infections as they like sugar-laden tissues. A woman may learn from her OBGYN that her constant vaginal infections are really due to hyperglycemia. There's also the classic ER presentation of a patient in DKA. Without sufficient glucose entering the cells, ketones are produced as a metabolic waste product of exclusive fat breakdown for energy. Ketones lower the pH of the blood and result in metabolic acidosis. Students will be required to know the criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes. The first is an A1C in excess of 6.5%. And of course, all this is with signs and symptoms of diabetes. Or a fasting plasma glucose in excess of 126 milligrams per deciliter. And fasting is defined as a uh, no calorie intake for eight hours. Or a two hour plasma glucose that exceeds 200 milligrams per deciliter during an oral glucose tolerance test. Or if a patient presents with the classic symptoms and there's a random plasma glucose above 200 milligrams per deciliter. Of course, you'd want to repeat this uh, test, especially if there are no symptoms. The reason that A1C appears at the top of this list is that it is affected less by day-to-day -day changes. However, optimal levels can vary by age and race. 
For conditions with abnormal red cell turnover, such as pregnancy, recent blood loss or transfusion, or some other type of anemia, the diagnosis of diabetes must employ some other glucose criteria exclusively. If a patient meets the diabetes criterion of the A1C uh, on two results that's greater than 6.5%, but not the fasting plasma glucose or vice versa, that person should still be considered to have diabetes. We also in recent years have uh, understood that catching people in what we call the pre-diabetic state, uh, if treated, can prevent the progression to full-blown diabetes. If a person has a fasting plasma glucose of 100 milligrams per deciliter to 125, we consider that a pre-diabetic condition. Or, after an oral glucose tolerance test of 75 grams of anhydrous glucose, their blood sugar is 140 to 199, they are considered to be pre-diabetic. Or, an A1C is between 5.7 and 6.4%. For all three tests, the risk is continuous, extending below the upper limit of the range and becoming disproportionately greater at the higher ends of these ranges. Screening for prediabetes is very important. Individuals with lab values suggestive of prediabetes are likely to meet the diagnostic criteria for diabetes within five years without treatment. And speaking of screening, there's a long list of people who need to be tested and screened for diabetes. It should be considered in all adults who are overweight, who are inactive, who have diabetes in their family, or part of a high-risk ethnic group, women who've had a child weighing more than nine pounds or who were diagnosed with diabetes during pregnancy because gestational diabetes makes the mother and the infant more likely to develop diabetes later in life hypertensive patients, patients who have high cholesterol levels or hypertriglyceridemia, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, and then we talked about the pre-diabetic uh, lab work or other clinical conditions associated with insulin resistance, such as severe obesity, acanthosis, or a history of heart disease. As many as 25% of Americans with type 2 diabetes are undiagnosed. The vascular damage will continue unchecked, resulting sometimes in um, irreversible kidney damage, vision problems, wounds that won't heal, and other conditions such as neuropathies far into the uh, disease well before it's ever diagnosed. There's also some tests called islet autoantibodies. It can identify individuals who are at risk for developing type 1 diabetes. In the absence of all the criteria that we just mentioned, testing for diabetes should still begin at age 45. If results are normal, it should be repeated at least every three years, with consideration of more frequent testing depending on the initial results. There's a particular interest in testing children because it is increasing in pediatric populations. Children who are overweight, we have from a family history with diabetes, again from a ethnic group that is more prone to develop diabetes, or they have signs of insulin resistance such as acanthosis as you see here in these pictures. If there's a maternal history, uh, early age of puberty onset, and again we want to do this every three years in suspected children. So if we uh, want to run an oral glucose tolerance test, they'd be given the 75 grams and check their glucose uh, fasting one and two hours. This would happen uh, in gestational period for women who were not previously diagnosed with diabetes. It should be performed uh, the morning after an overnight fast of at least eight hours. And it, of course, it has its own diagnostic lab values for pregnancy. Individuals identified as pre-diabetic can slow or prevent the progression to full-blown diabetes if they follow the steps identified on this slide. 
As little as 7% weight loss can bring down blood pressure, it can normalize blood lipids, and it can attenuate the climb of baseline blood glucose and A1C. Metformin is often given to people to prevent the development of diabetes. Exercise can increase the efficiency of insulin that's produced and its uptake into the cells. There's some studies out there that suggest that almost 60% of people with prediabetes who engaged in a lifestyle intervention reduced their development of full-blown diabetes. Of course, this is particularly important in children, especially obese children. They have a one out of four chance of developing diabetes because they already have prediabetes. There are numerous comorbid conditions associated with diabetes. Unfortunately, many cases of type 2 have gone undiagnosed for years. These conditions may already be well advanced before the patient seeks treatment. So when you are examining the uh, patient with diabetes, you need to be very thorough. Vision, renal, neurological tests, cardiovascular, dental exams, skin tests, many others are suggested. Team management usually results in much better outcomes for these patients. However, the per person with diabetes is going to have to assume quite a bit of management and control over their condition. The main focus is glycemic control. There are two types of self-monitoring of blood glucose. Uh, one can be done intermittently throughout the day for patients on insulin at least four to six times a day. Uh, for patients who are pre-diabetic, we suggest monitoring maybe once or twice a day, maybe up to three times a day. There's also continuous interstitial glucose monitoring. It's very helpful to identify periods of high and low blood sugars throughout the day. Now you'd want to confirm this with a glucometer because sometimes those, um, those machines aren't particularly accurate. When a patient's A1C begins to rise in a type 2 diabetic, we would start to add insulin. Up to 40% of type 2 patients will need insulin to achieve control. This is why A1C should be measured quarterly or uh, twice a year. The reason that A1C, as we said before, is such a good monitor is that um, these glycosylated red blood cells give us a view of the patient's glucose status for the past three months. A1C rises one point with every 35 milligrams per deciliter of glucose increase. A lower A1C will reduce long-term complications of type 1 or type 2 diabetes. But again, it does require a multi-management approach. And we'll talk about that in the next video presentations.